Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the virtual expert roundtable on high temperature gas cooled reactors and industrial heat applications. People from around the world have registered to participate in this event. So, to ensure a stable connection and considering the large number of attendees, your video and audio functions have been disabled. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Deanne Cameron. I am the head of the division at the Nuclear Energy Agency that is responsible for nuclear technology development and economics. And it's my pleasure to be opening the session today and kicking us off. I'm very pleased uh, that you've joined us today for the launch of the Nuclear Energy Agency's latest report titled High Temperature Gas-Cooled Reactors and Industrial Applications. Uh, before we jump into the session today, I'd like to start by setting out a little bit of context for our discussion today. And that context is global priorities, not only on decarbonization and deep decarbonization of all aspects of the economy, including industrial applications, but now also renewed focus and renewed global priorities on the security of energy supply. Earlier this year, um, in a publication that really helps to set the context for all of our future work uh, on the applications of nuclear innovation, uh, the NEA published a report on the role of nuclear energy in pathways to net zero. And what we laid out in that, in that piece is a framework for thinking about the role of nuclear energy, broadly speaking, and for understanding the, the, the core uh, role that nuclear energy must play, but also the aspirational role that we can together be working towards uh, to achieve. And that is for nuclear to play a role from long-term operations, but also from new builds of large-scale power reactors from generation three technologies. We also need to be looking ahead to the future to the role of generation four technologies and small modular reactors. And equally important, we must be looking ahead to the possible application of nuclear technologies for high temperature applications, for heat, direct heat, for district heating, but also desalination and high temperature applications for heavy industry and applications for the production of hydrogen and synthetic fuels. And only through the application of this entire sort of portfolio approach to nuclear energy from what we call LTO or long-term operations, generation three and generation four new builds, small modular reactors, as well as heat and hydrogen, can the nuclear sector really achieve its full potential and play the role that it needs to play in meeting global ambitions for for secure uh, energy supply and deep decarbonization across economies. On small modular reactors, NEA has a new SMR strategy that we are launching in 2022. Um, and on heat in particular, this is a growing area of work for us. And we are pleased to be discussing this topic with you today. Uh, today's discussion builds on a 2021 workshop, a workshop in 2021 that many of you may have participated in, where we began for the first time to bring together really not only the technology developers of these innovative high temperature nuclear technologies, but also the prospective end users and the industrial customers uh, for these technologies, the industrials that have ambitions or objectives or commitments to decarbonize their operations, which really requires um, large scale viable and economic alternatives to natural gas and coal co-generation. Uh, building on that workshop in 2021, we undertook initial, an additional analysis in-house by the NEA, which is what we'll be presenting today. Uh, and really a key takeaway from all of this work today has been about um, what can be achieved when we bring together um, strategic discussions and strategic partnerships and collaborations, not only along the full and across the full nuclear uh, technology sector and up and down the entire nuclear supply chain, but also connecting to other um, connecting those collaborations and those conversations between the nuclear sector and prospective end user heavy industries. By bringing together both the development side and also the demand side, we can have a much more integrated conversation that leads to, um, that leads to greater insights uh, and, and critical information about what it will take uh, to bring these, uh, these potential technologies to successful develop deployment. 
Um, today, we're bringing together again a conversation that reflects the entire spectrum, bringing together not only the nuclear perspective, but also the demand side perspective. And we've invited a young leader from the International Youth Nuclear Congress to moderate the expert panel discussion today. Younger generations have an excitement uh, about the potential of future innovation to meet climate objectives and to really achieve deep decarbonization, and they're an important key voice in this conversation. So now uh, let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you Hiroyuki Goto. He is an analyst from my team at the NEA, and he'll be presenting the findings of our report that will be available on our website today. Hiroyuki Goto joined the NEA in 2019. Since then, he has, for, he has been working for uh, on research activities related to technology development in the nuclear field, in particular related to advanced reactor technologies and more recently related to high temperature. Uh, uh, advanced reactor technologies. Prior to joining the NEA, he worked for the Kansai Electric Power Company as the manager of nuclear safety and emergency preparedness at OE Nuclear Power Station in Japan. He has over 13 years of experience in nuclear power plant operation and safety design and holds a master's degree in energy science from Kyoto University. It's my pleasure to introduce Hiroyuki Goto and Hiroyuki, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Diane, for the introduction, and welcome everyone to today's event. This is Hiroki Goto from NEA. Today, I will present key findings from our new report, High Temperature Gas Cooled Reactors and Industrial Heat Applications. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all people who gave many valuable insights, advice, and any kinds of support to complete this study. So uh, let's move to the background and the motivation for this study. So uh, decarbonization of the industrial sector is an inevitable but very difficult challenge toward achieving a carbon neutral society. This diagram on the right shows the global energy related CO2 emissions by sector. As you can see, industrial sector accounts for one quarter of it and is the second largest source of CO2. Besides, the industrial sector is called the hard to abate sector because it requires a high temperature and large scale heat supply. And currently, there are a few options for such low carbon heat sources widely available in the commercial scale. Longer asset lifetime and highly competitive market situations are also considered making it difficult. High temperature gas cool reactor or HTGR is an advanced reactor technology under development. This technology could generate much higher temperature heat than conventional nuclear reactors. This high temperature feature indicates that ATGRs have the potential to significantly expand the range of industrial applications of low carbon nuclear heat. The picture on the right shows typical process temperature of different industrial sectors and the temperature range of nuclear heat at the bottom. Indeed, Nuclear heat from conventional nuclear reactors has been used over decades in many countries to support industries with process temperature lower than 150 degrees Celsius, such as district heating and paper production and so on. The outlet temperature of ATGR, typically over 700 degrees Celsius, and in the future up to 1000 degrees Celsius with very high temperature reactor technologies or VHTR, could be used for providing process heat for various other industrial sectors. With this background, this study aims to better understand the potential, limitations, and challenges of ETGRs for industrial heat applications. This shows rough structure of our study, which consists of three contents. One is the study on technological feature of ETGRs, and the other is the assessment of potential industrial applications of ATGR heat, then identify remaining challenges for ATGR to be used for industrial applications. This study is based on literature reviews on this topic, individual expertise interviews, and the discussion in the NEA workshop, high temperature reactors and industrial heat applications that is held uh, last year. So, Let's move on to the first content, the technological feature of ATGR. This diagram shows development history of ATGRs. 
The first experimental HDGR dragon was developed in 1964 in the UK. It was followed by some other experimental reactors and commercial scale demonstrators in the US and Germany. Now, uh, there are two operating ATGRs for R&D purpose, ATTR in Japan and ATR10 in China. And recently, a Chinese commercial scale demonstrator, ATRPM, reached its first criticality last year and expected to be fully operational within this year. Over this more than half a century development history, ATGR technology has improved reflecting the operational experience in these experimental and demonstration reactors. One of the prominent examples is the development of tri software, which will be explained later. And other examples include the magnetic bearing for helium circulators and the steel structured pressure vessel. The reliability of these technologies has been demonstrated in the past and currently operating ATGRs. Well, what is ATGR? HTGR is defined as helium cooled graphite moderated nuclear fission reactor that uses fully ceramic fuels. The helium coolant is chemically inert even in a very high temperature condition, and graphite moderator has large thermal capacity and heat transfer properties. The fully ceramic tri-fuel particle or tri-structural isotropic coated fuel particle consists of uranium oxide or uranium oxycarbide fuel, fuel panel. It is the orange ball in the picture here and surrounding multiple ceramic coating layers that provide the primary fission product retention barriers. The fuel particles are baked into spherical or cylindrical matrix graphite and then loaded into the reactor core. With these elements and also with appropriate system design, ATGRs has achieved an enhanced safety feature. The decay heat and residual heat of reactor core can be possibly removed in, removed in an accident situation. The reactor temperature rises slowly after an accident and no operator's action is required over a week or more. The reactor temperature after an accident will not reach the temperature limit of trice of fuel. Thus, robust confinement of radioactive material can be maintained. These technological elements also support the high temperature outlet heat from ATGRs. The reactor outlet temperature of ATGR is typically more than 700 degrees Celsius. As shown in the top of the light figure, the reactor outlet heat is transferred to industrial plus heat medium via intermediate circuit with heat exchangers or heat steam generators. As a result, in the case of currently proposed ATGR design, the temperature of process heat is around 550 degrees Celsius for steam or 700 degrees or higher if they choose nitrogen or high helium gas for industrial heat medium. The proposed design output size ranges from 10 to more than 600 megawatt summer class. Some design concepts propose multiple unit installation depending on the scale of demand and operational requirements. There are some variations in heat supply system. For example, as shown in the middle of the figure, some design, pro some design proposed to equip with intermediate thermal storage to cope with large fluctuations in heat demand. The bottom is an example for cogeneration system of process heat and electricity generation. Well, what are the benefits of using ATGRs for industrial heat? As repeated, ATGR can supply low carbon and high temperature process heat. Of course, there are many other potential technologies for low carbon heat as heat, as shown in the light figures, and other technologies may be able to be used for high temperature, higher temperature. Uh, but none of them is not yet widely available in a commercial scale today. One advantage of ATGR is its abundant uranium reserves and could be used where access to sustainable biomass and renewable energies is limited. Also, ATGRs, once fueled, can operate over one or two years or even over 20 years, depending on the design, which contribute to security of supply. 
HDGR heat is reliable as its, as its operation is not affected by the weather condition. They can operate flexible, responding to heat demand. The reactor core can cope with load fluctuations to some extent, and as mentioned earlier, uh, it can also cope with larger load fluctuations when combined with intermediate thermal storage or cogeneration system. The wide range of output size of proposed ATGR designs also helps flexible deployment. Well, uh, ATGR is not a perfect solution, unlike uh, various other technologies. First, ATGR will generate a large volume of radioactive graphite waste. Its radioactive level is low, but it contains radionuclides with very long half lives over thousands, year, thousands of years. The graphite waste issue is not U1, and there are accumulation of radioactive graphite, graphite waste worldwide without disposal. And efforts are underway to develop disposal facilities and to develop methods for volume reduction and reuse of such waste. Second, the robust confinement of trisulfur fuel is useful in direct disposal, but for reprocessing of spent trisulfur fuel, further technological development is required. But studies suggest that the reprocessing of trisulfur fuel is possible and the basic technologies are already available. Third, the real cost of HDGR heat is still uncertain. Some studies suggest cost advantage of ATGR heat under certain conditions, but the lack of actual projects that complete construction and operation of modern ATGRs makes it difficult to estimate the real cost of ATGR heat. The demonstration project that are planned or proposed in the US and Canada will provide some reliable information about the cost of ATGRs when it's completed. Well, next, uh, let's move to the potential applications of HDGR heat. The global industrial heat demand is really huge, but for which part of it we can use HDGR heat? From our study, we found four aspects of industrial sectors that determine the applicability of HDGR heat in general. One is process temperature. Ideally, Process temperature should be in the range of process heat from ATGR, up to 550 degrees Celsius for steam and around 700 degrees Celsius for nitrogen or heavy gas. The light graph shows the distribution of industrial heat demand by temperature in Europe. And you can see that a considerable part of heat demand falls within the temperature range of ATGRs. For higher temperature processes, ATGR heat can be used in combination with temperature boosting technologies, but the energy efficiency will, would, be, uh, would be lower. Second is process compatibility. The easiest approach to couple ATGRs with industrial processes is to plug in ATGRs into existing steam pipeline to distribute the output steam. In other cases, the heat supply system is so closely embedded in production processes that applying ATGR heat may require a major redesign of their heat, heat supply system, or in some cases, uh, they may need entirely new production technologies. Third, the energy demand of an individual facility or a group of neighboring facilities should be large enough to accommodate the energy output from at least one ATGR. Lastly, time duration of heat user. Some of the potential applications of process heat have limited asset lifetimes, such as mining industries that depend on resource availability. Operating lifetime of ATGR should be consistent with these industry asset lifetime. In light, with, in light of these points, NEA assessed the applicability of ATGR heat to various industrial sectors by reviewing the existing literature. However, the last point, time duration of heat user was excluded from the assessment because the situation seems greatly different, different site by site. Uh, besides, we found that demand sizes of major industrial facilities are typically large enough to accommodate one or more ATGRs in many industrial sectors. As a result, the assessment was 
determined mostly by the first two aspects, process temperature and process compatibility. This diagram provides a broad summary of the assessment result. The horizontal axis shows typical process temperatures for each industrial sector. The vertical axis is not a quant quantitative measure, but classified each sector into high, middle, low in terms of, in terms of process compatibility. Let me explain one example. You can see chemicals slightly below the middle of the diagram. In chemical, in chemical production sites, many production processes are covered by steam under around 500 degrees Celsius. That is supplied externally from, from pipelines. Uh, for this part, ATGR heat would be relatively easy to apply. So process compatibility is assessed as high, thus shown in green color. However, certain processes, typically NAFSA cracking process, you can see to the right, uh, they have much higher process temperature and are usually equipped with dedicated heating devices, such as fuel burners. To these processes, the process compatibility is considered as low, thus colored in gray. The assessment for each industrial sector is provided, provided in the report, but for today, I will present the major findings from the assessment. First, these green colored industries are considered the most possible near-term opportunities to apply ATGR heat, which include seawater desalination, district heating, bitumen recovery from oil sands, soda ash, and chemical production. These industries typically use process steam supplied through pipelines, thus ATGR heat can be applied by just plugging into the pipeline. Existing backup capacities for the pipeline system also help ATGRs to take part in their processes. The orange colored industries have suitable te process temperature for ATGR heat. However, their heat supply system is closely embedded into their production processes. Therefore, applying ATGR heat is not as easy as in green colored industries explained before but we consider it to be possible. Regarding hydrogen and ammonia production, some studies suggest ATGR heat could be used for preheating of feedstock to reduce the combustion of fossil fuel for hydrogen production using conventional natural gas reforming. Well, hydrogen and ammonia are considered as important energy carrier for low carbon society, and their demand is expected to dramatically increase in the future. The conventional hydrogen production method, natural gas reforming, is already proven and widely used technology in a commercial scale. And for this technology, ATGR heat could be used for reducing HCO2 from fuel combustion. However, its contribution is limited, and process-related carbon emissions would remain untouched, which accounts for 60% of emissions from hydrogen production. CCUS technologies could reduce some part of it, but given the possible removal rates and the expected increase in hydrogen production in the future, it is pointed out that the residual CO2 emissions could have a significant impact on climate change. Further potential for ATGR heat to contribute to low carbon hydrogen production lies in combination with advanced production methods such as high temperature steam electrolysis and some chemical cycle process. These technologies are still under development or demonstration phase and HDGR technologies also need further development to produce relevant temperature steam or helium gas in a commercial scale for these methods. However, by using HDGR heat and power in these production methods, the CO2 emissions from hydrogen production could be reduced to almost zero. Besides, these advanced methods are expected to achieve higher overall energy efficiency than low temperature electrolysis method, which is closer to commercial use. Overall, the development of these advanced hydrogen production technologies and the development of very high temperature reactor technologies have a significant potential to contribute global decarbonization. So, what are the remaining challenges of ATGRs to be used for industrial heat supply? 
First, as mentioned earlier, ATGRs have enhanced safety feature. And of course, safety consideration related to coupling and co-location of ATGRs with industrial facilities must be properly addressed in design, licensing, and operation. Safety consideration specific to coupling and co-location include avoidance of cross-contamination, management of thermal disturbance, and protection against possible external hazards such as chemical explosion and toxic gas release accident in industrial facilities. Since many countermeasure technologies are already available, so it is important to appropriately select and design countermeasures tailored to the process and site characteristics. Second, not only for safety requirement, but also operational requirement for industrial heat user should be met. Typically, large industrial users need 100% availability of heat supply and very high system reliability. Besides, HGR heat supply system should be flexible enough to accommodate anticipated load fluctuations during the normal operation and transient conditions of the industrial facilities. These safety and operational measures related to coupling and co-location have to be consistent with the licensing and regulatory requirements. In particular, since it involves potential overlaps uh, and conflicts between nuclear and non-nuclear industrial regulations, the jurisdictional scope of nuclear and other industrial regulations, regulations and boundary condition requirements between different jurisdictional areas should be clarified and coordinated. In addition to these technological points, clear perspectives of construction and operation cost and development timeline are very important so that, uh, so that ATGRs can be incorporated into the business strategies of industrial heat users. Next is supply chain availability. Supply chain is essential for any kind of technology to be used for commercial purpose. In particular, for ATGRs, the development of supply chain capacity for high assay, low enrichment uranium fuel, HALU fuel, is the most pressing issue. HALU fuel is an uranium fuel with a uranium, enrich uranium enrichment level of more than 5% up to 20% and is used in many advanced reactor designs, including ATGRs. Halo fuel demand is expected to start increasing, start increasing rapidly uh, within a decade, but currently there is only a very limited supply capacity available in the world. Indeed, the Halo enrichment and other related technologies are not new technologies, but the development of commercial capacity to handle such fuel requires many years and significant upfront investment including licensing of such facilities. Last but not least, public and stakeholder understanding and acceptance is of primary importance. Unlike conventional nuclear plants for power generation, ATGRs for industrial heat supply need to physically connect it to industrial facilities and need to locate it close to industrial facilities to avoid heat loss during heat transportation. Therefore, effort to gain public understanding and acceptance have to address wider stakeholder perspectives or concerns than those for conventional nuclear sites for power generation. So then conclusions. This slide shows the four key findings from this study. As discussed so far today, ATGRs could be technical solution for decarbonizing industrial heat sector and could be used for various sectors. The availability of steam pipelines will provide the nearest term opportunities for ATGR heat. Advanced hydrogen production and VHTR technologies could open further potential with TGRs for contributing to global decarbonization. The remaining challenges are mostly related to coupling and co-location of ATGRs with industrial facilities and enabling conditions of such applications, including regulatory scheme, supply chain, and public acceptance. Here are the recommendations to address these remaining challenges. First, site or process-specific analysis for the coupling and co-location of ATGRs with industrial processes 
will provide a more realistic understanding of whether and how ETGRs can be applied to specific industrial facilities. Aside from such analytic, analytical uh, activities, the planning and execution of demonstration project using actual facilities will be the most convincing avenue toward commercial deployment of such applications. Second, um, many challenges lie in the boundary between nuclear and nuclear, nuclear and non-nuclear industry sector in terms, of, in terms of both technology and regulation. Therefore, communication and collaboration between industry players and regulatory authorities of different sectors, as well as a wide range of stakeholders is really essential. Third, the development of heavy fuel supply chain should be in timely manner so that it could support development of ATGRs and other advanced nuclear technologies. Lastly, effort to realize industrial heat applications of ATGR will require long period of time and large upfront investment. Therefore, government's commitment to support projects that are perceived difficult but will greatly contribute to the country's decarbonization policy is essential so that private sector and investors can engage in such projects. At the practical level, Predictable, predictable and effective incentive schemes will provide industry, industrial players with some visibility of potential future revenues from these technologies. With this, I will finish my presentation. Thank you for my listening. Thank you for your listening. And now I hand it over to Diane. Thank you so much, uh, Hiroyuki. That was a fantastic. Uh, presentation of the report. Uh, again, for the audience, the report will be available on our website later today. This was a great overview of the key findings, uh, but I know uh, many of you will be eager to, to read the report in all of its detail. Um, I'd now like to, uh, to turn to our panel, uh, the panel portion of today's discussion. And for that, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our moderator, Lina Andriolo. Lina is president of the International Youth Nuclear Congress, IYNC. She has been involved in IYNC since 2014. She's held various positions within that organization, leading multicultural and diverse teams of young professionals, and has participated in many activities, including organizing two international congresses. In her professional life, Lena is an R&D project manager for radioactive waste management at EDF in France. And previously, she was in charge of R&D developments and analyses in the field of severe accident simulations for both fast reactors and light water reactors. She holds a PhD from the University of Grenoble in the Alps, as well as a master's in research in energy and physics and a nuclear engineering degree from the Grenoble Institute of Technology in France. Uh, Lina, thank you so much for agreeing to moderate our panel discussion today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diane, uh, for the introduction and for the opportunity. I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of the IYNC, and I would like now to invite our panelists today to join the floor by turning on uh, their cameras. Um, it's my pleasure to first introduce to you Dr. Michael Futara from the European Commission's Joint Research Center in the Netherlands. Michael currently manages the GRC project portfolio on nuclear energy for decarbonization. He has more than 25 years of experience in project and network development with focus on feasibility studies, irradiation testing of fuel and materials, system design and analysis for high temperature reactors, nuclear cogeneration, production of hydrogen and its derivatives, and energy system integration. He actively participated in most EU projects on HTRs and has supported the European Nuclear Cogeneration Industrial Initiative from the very start. He is also actively involved in the Generation 4 International Forum. Next, I'd like to introduce Aurora Young. Aurora is a senior engineer strategic technologies at Cinovus Energy. Aurora has more than 15 years of experience working in the oil and gas industry, where she has focused on energy project development, strategy and business development. She currently works in strategic innovation, 
leading change by progressing clean tech and other technologies that improve the value of energy products and contribute to decarbonization. She is also a representative of the SMR Working Group within the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. Finally, I'd like also to introduce Dr. Hiroyuki Sato from GAEA. Hiroyuki is a general manager at the HTGR Research and Development Center of GAEA in Oarai, Japan. He joined the GAEA in 2006 and has 15 years of experience in system design and safety assessment for HTGRs. He has also been a member of the GIF BHTR System Steering Committee since 2016. So, also, th thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so maybe uh, to start our discussion today and following the very interesting presentation we just got, I'd like to ask each of you actually, if you could detail what you have been working on on the topic of HTGRs for industrial heat applications. And maybe Michael, if you'd like to start with that question. Yes, uh, thank you, Lena. Um, very pleased to be on that panel today. So. Um, to answer your question, when I joined the European Commission's uh, Joint Research Center in Petten in the Netherlands, my first job here was actually in um, consisting in uh, supporting the freshly created pan-European uh, network on HDI technology, which coordinated a number of projects already at that time, uh, and uh, they developed also we. I must say, uh, developed strong international cooperation on specific topics with many interested organizations around, around the globe. And uh, one of these topics was uh, HDR fuel irradiation testing in the HFR Patton here, that's the reactor um, that we run here in Patton, and uh, it is a major element on the critical path in the fuel qualification and licensing process. So that's why uh, we need a lot of lead time to, to be successful, successful in, in this area. And then over the years at the GSC, we have worked um, for basically all European HDR projects uh, in different functions and in areas such as fuel, structural and functional materials, uh, think graphite for example, uh, conceptual design, safety analysis, waste minimization, uh, market studies, non-electric applications, um, process steam, hydrogen, methanol, ammonia and all uh, their role in decarbonization. Huh? So what, what is in us in, in all these technologies for decarbonization and uh, energy security that is becoming even more important today. So another area is now hybrid energy system design with HDRs where nuclear can complement variable renewables for optimized cost efficiency and impact. Um, also, um, it's on the radar of many people now. Uh, all these subjects uh, are, of course, uh, highly relevant also to uh, policymakers uh, worldwide. So uh, today, this initially small technology-focused network uh, of organizations on HDR and cogeneration has become the uh, what we call nuclear cogeneration industrial initiative in Europe. Uh, so that's um, an association of uh, interested companies. We currently have around 25 in there, major players in nuclear. And uh, the objective of the association is to support demonstration and deployment of nuclear code generation. We think that's uh, the obligatory next step. And uh, this should happen with uh, passively safe HDRs and in those countries that are interested in this technology. Um, it has merged, uh, so NC2I, uh, it has merged with our uh, European Sustainable Nuclear Energy Technology Platform. Sorry, this is a very bulky name, but it's another association which looks at uh, nuclear uh, globally at uh, the European level with uh, this time more than 100 member organizations. All the big players are in there and EDF, Lena, <laughs> is, in, is in there as well, of course. Um, the work uh, of NC2I is contributing to several projects, working groups and task forces of the Generation for International Forum, and it bundles also the R&D efforts of currently 10 member countries. So that's uh, quite a number of people uh, interested in the subject. So over the last 10 years, NC2I has increasingly, increasingly worked with industry also, potential end users, uh, vendor companies, supply chain firms, consultants on market research with regulators and policymakers, uh, and to, um, together with uh, similar organizations in the US, South Korea and Japan, uh, we had created the Gemini Initiative, where we support each other in efforts towards demonstration and deployment. So uh, I feel now that this compelling case for decarbonization with nuclear is um, uh, being heard now and understood, and the boundary conditions for that are now uh, positive. Uh, one of them is the price of natural gas. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, when the price of natural gas uh, goes up, it's positive for nuclear. And uh, so I think it's the right time to take the next steps. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mike. A very impressive history of uh, joint and growing efforts. Um, Aurora, maybe you could also detail what uh, your company has been doing in this regard. Hi, good morning from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Yeah, um, I think it would be great to provide a little bit of context in terms of what's happening for us. The Canadian oil sands companies do share in the world's concern about climate change. And so many credible independent forecasts indicate that hydrocarbons will continue to be required as a part of the global energy mix for many decades. And so as a transportation fuel and as building blocks, uh, for the products that we use every day. And so as a part of the commitment for lowering our emissions that is associated with production, we believe that small modular reactors can provide a safe and effective potential way to um, reach our ambition of net zero emissions by 2050. So Synovis is a member of the Oil Sands Pathway to Net Zero Alliance, and that's an unprecedented alliance that brings, brings together Canada's six largest oil sands producers, and we're working collectively with the federal and Alberta governments to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions for, from our company's oil sands operations by 2050. So that meets Canada's climate change goals um, and, and as well as, as getting us to a 2050 net zero aspiration. So within the Alliance, we are considering solutions such as carbon capture, which is what was mentioned in, in the overall um, discussion on in, in terms of this report. So some of the things that had been mentioned in the report as possible replacement opportunities, we can look at carbon capture and storage, we can look at hydrogen blending, and then of course, mod small modular reactors are also being considered as technology that could do that for us. So the premiers of uh, four provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick, signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding in 2021, saying that we want to develop and deploy small modular reactors as a tool to decarbonize our provinces. And SMR work in Canada considers three streams for SMRs at this time. So near-term on grid, generation four reactors, and micro SMRs for remote locations. And we're monitoring the progress that's happening in those initiatives, especially what's happening in, in Gen 4, and that's where the high temperature gas reactors are of particular interest. So we're considering how these developments are going to apply, um, how we can, and, and how we can consider them, and, and we want to consider how we can drive specifically for industrial heat applications. Thank you very much, Aurora. Um, and actually, all that you are mentioning uh, relies on the heavy R&D, I would say, before uh, it can uh, be it can come to the market. So I would like to turn to um, Sato-san, whether you could also detail um, what has been uh, done in the R&D field. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I have been working at JAS since 2006, and since then, I have been working for the uh, R&D, for the HTGR and the hydrogen production uh, technology. JAEA has been conducting R&Ds towards commercial deployment of HTGR with a central focus on the use of the HTTR, a 30 megawatt thermal HTGR test reactor located in ORI Research Institute of JAEA. The reactor is the only prismatic type HTGR in operation in the world. The reactor attained a successful full power operation in 2001, and the reactor achieved a continuous reactor operation with reactor outlet temperature of 950 degrees C for 50 days in 2010. The reactor has been shut down for about 10 years due to the regulatory review on conformity to the new regulatory requirements. But we have obtained permission for the application, and the HTTR has just restarted its operation last year. The HTTR is a unique and valuable tool and can be a tremendous asset for HTGR commercialization and industrial heat application. We have conducted safety demonstration tests, including the past and planning additional one as an OECD NEA HTTR Rock C project. We are also planning a HTTR heat application test, a nuclear hydrogen production demonstration. The test aims to develop coupling technologies between HTGR and hydrogen production plant. 
Thank you very much. Um, if you all agree, I would like to dig a little bit deeper into the different points that you have just mentioned. Um, and so actually, Aurora, you specifically mentioned that you are monitoring the development of uh, SMRs and that you are considering how these technologies can apply to your specific applications. Um, could you maybe share with us what uh, areas are of primary interest to these current considerations? Yeah, for sure. I'd say we're working on three specific things or three initiatives at this time. So we're looking at assessing what our needs are in terms of that process specific coupling, the technical feasibility and how we can take advantage of modularization. And so first on that assessing our needs, we, we want to drive for the, that high temperature application. And what we're doing is we're considering what our criteria, what our requirements are, and really kind of coming up with a concept in terms of, you know, is that something that, that we collectively can determine um, whether that can be bucketed into, into one or maybe a couple of different use cases. And one of the things we've also been working on is coming up with an assessment of how large the demand is. Just even for the Canadian oil sands in itself, we know that, that the potential is, is much broader. But you know, just getting giving a high level concept of what that demand looks like um, for the production of around 33,000 barrels a day of bitumen, we require about 575 megawatt thermal. So that would be the thermal and the electric requirements, the, the thermal demand that's required for both the steam to produce our bitumen as well as the electricity that we need at our sites. And the Canadian oil sands are currently producing 3 million barrels of bitumen a day. So that that really starts to get, give some perspective in terms of the amount of thermal demand that we would be looking for. So in terms of the, the second part of this, in terms of the, the technical feasibility, so the feasibility assessment is a preliminary step that's required uh, in order for us to make sure that SMRs can work safely uh, technically within our oil sands uh, operation, getting that process specific coupling um, integration assessment. And, and then that also feeds into the economics of, of that particular application. And so we are reviewing and assessing all of the various technologies, the fuels, the systems in terms of how they can integrate with our plant um, and the operating system. And, and that also goes to some of the requirements that we have like the reliability. And so we're looking also at the advanced reactors because of a lot of the benefits that they provide, specifically the lower water usage requirements. So, you know, relative to traditional larger reactors, we think that the advanced reactors are much better suited in terms of how we're building in remote locations um, and landlocked lo locations, such as where our oil sands facilities are. And so our early work indicates that uh, SMRs do have the potential to be cost competitive, a safe solution that replaces our gas fired boilers, um, and that they can be used to generate that, that emission free steam and electricity at our sites. And particular, particularly for the case of SAG-D, where we have a lot of, of high temperature, um, well, I'm going to say um, relative to the temperatures that, that you are showing, um, maybe not as, as high, but, you know, higher temperature than the light water reactors um, in, in those range. So that's the benefit that the high temperature reactors can, can do for us in, in SAG-D. And so our, our third initiative in terms of looking at that assessment, the advantage of the modularization, we think that that's a very key uh, potential for the fleet deployment. That's how we, we would achieve that nth of a kind um, cost benefit. And so that's really important in, in some of this assessment work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Aurora. Um, so actually, I think that uh, from what you just mentioned, we can narrow it down to three key points, basically, uh, which are the market demands, as you were also mentioning, uh, the technical feasibility, which is a prerequisite, uh, and as well, uh, cost. Um, so maybe to Michael, I'd like to ask a question on these three key points, um, because uh, you have been working uh, in the in European studies on such points. And so what would what are the major outcomes uh, from your previous studies? 
Um, yes, I, I would like to give you a couple of uh, ballpark figures from, from the European projects, just to um, give you an understanding of the, the scale of the, the, the problems and uh, that we want to solve with this technology. So, um, uh, as part of a cooperation with end-user companies, we had uh, estimated the demand of uh, steam, only very uh, simple 550 degree steam in the EU as almost 90 gigawatt thermal. 90 gigawatt thermal, that is um, uh, very significant, same order of magnitude uh, than uh, the nuclear installation, which is uh, 104 gigawatt electric just now uh, in Europe. So uh, th this steam is a commodity used in uh, for many different purposes on many industrial sites, and it's today almost exclusively produced by uh, natural gas and coal, which uh, means it's a ma major producer of greenhouse gases as well. So uh, HDRs or HDGRs could uh, produce such steam uh, very easily. So uh, we had looked into the market uh, afterwards and we had also found that in ma on many sites there are standardized boilers, um, typically of the size of uh, 165 megawatt thermal net. So this is about the unit size that uh, you would uh, expect and that's something that the market demands. So we have been working on that. So um, we had um, also looked in uh, to uh, for example, the uh, power distribution bit on different sites, because many sites demand heat, hydrogen and electricity together. And uh, just to give you a few uh, examples here, most of the um, sites that we had uh, more than 100 um, looked into, uh, they used between 100 and 200 megawatt thermal and less than 200 megawatt electric. Um, still, there are sites that go into the gigawatt range, so you could uh, really build big power plants for them alone. So, and uh, this is for continuous power supply 24-7, 365. So, keep that in mind because you have to build in also the um, outages. So specifically in Poland, uh, we have looked into th the 13 largest chemical sites and they require together 6.5 gigawatt thermal of heat, very simple level 400 to 550 degrees C. So this is um, uh, quite uh, accessible for high temperature reactors. So um, just uh, two more uh, examples, for, exa um, for example, uh, the hydrogen market. Hydrogen, we have found, is one other very big market. Uh, we don't have to wait for a, a potential future hydrogen economy to make that real. It's already there. We have in Europe a demand and consumption of 10 million um, tons per year, 10 million tons per year. So if we wanted to produce this by typical well, uh, electrolysis, low temperature, this would require some 50 gigawatt electric, maybe a little bit more. So, and uh, if you wanted to use hydrogen for decarbonization, for example, of the steel industry or for the production of uh, synthetic fuels, which uh, everybody talks about now, uh, so this demand could easily uh, increase by a factor four from 10 to maybe 40 or 50 million tons per year. And for all that, we would need capacity. So uh, there were also studies performed in China, Korea, Japan, the UK, and I think also in Canada. Uh, they all came to similar conclusions conclusions and the conclusion is the market is not the limit. Thank you, Michael. I, I think that indeed the market availability, I would say, or the demand is a prerequisite indeed for the deployment of the technology. And from what you have just mentioned, we see that there are a lot of opportunities for such a, a deployment. Um, now, I would like to come back on the point of technical feasibility. That was one of the three key points that also Aurora uh, mentioned. And I would like uh, to turn to Sato-san uh, for this particular point. I'd like to ask you if you could give us some information about what has been proven uh, or demonstrated about the safety of HTGRs and about the integration of HTGRs with industrial processes. So I would like to talk uh, based on our experiences. So JAEA established a safety design that can be applied in commercial HTGRs through the licensing for the restart of the HTGR. So I'd like to explain two examples. The first one is the seismic classification. A safety demonstration test was conducted in 2010 at uh, the low level and reduced core flow rate to zero by tripping all circulators and no control loads were inserted. The test demonstrated that HTTR can maintain in a stable state even under the loss of cooling and or reactivity control conditions because of the inherent safe characteristic. So based on the demonstration, demonstrated results, we are able to obtain permission from regulatory authority to classify seismic classification of SSCs to lower class. 
The other example is the defense in-depth implementation for commercial HTGR. Because the HTGR safety features that maximum fuel temperature is always below the safety limit in all accidents and possibility of significant fuel damage are eliminated and large release of radioactive materials are practically eliminated, the concept of DID implementation is that specific SSCs are not required to cope with the beyond design basis accidents. In the regulatory authority review for the HTTR, the safety features and concept were authorized. As a result, that the HTTR has restarted its operation without significant additional reinforcements due to the inherent safety characteristic. The result leads us to the conclusion that the DID implementation for the commercial HTGR is reasonable. We think a remaining item to be sold is to establish a safety design for coupling of HTGRs with industrial applications. Thank you. Thank you, Sato-san. And actually, the NEA report also indicates the importance of the studies that you just mentioned. So maybe to go to san um, do you have any comments on, on these activities? Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we are really yes looking forward to the the, the result of activity of JAE to 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 develop the as a, as a technical study on the coupling of ATGR with industrial facilities, and also from the Aurora's uh, speech, I really get impressed that the the Canadian oil sand industry is really one step ahead in terms of the consideration of ATGR. And they are really uh, conducting specific study on potential application of ATGRs or SMRs in their industry. And so uh, during in, in her speech, yeah, she said about the, the requirement from their, their point of view. So I think it's important to this kind of uh, communication, I mean, uh, uh, clarifying the requirement of industry heat users and to show them to the Developer side. So I heard that in Canada, uh, more than 100 organizations from nuclear sector, industrial sector, heat users, governments, and many other stakeholders are communicating and collaborating under the framework of Canada's SMR action plan. Yeah, it seems really, and also it seems really task oriented, and they are working together on more than 500, 500 specific actions. So I found it really interesting approach to facilitate interactions across different sectors. So uh, we are looking forward to seeing the future progress. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Gutusan. Um, I think that, yeah, indeed, we have heard that there are many collaborations in this area. I think also a lot of opportunities. You mentioned also in your report some challenges. I would like that we dig a little bit into the challenges as well uh, for the development of uh, HTGRs for the industrial heat applications. And here I would like to turn to Michael again. Uh, you have been working for preparing the development uh, of HTGRs for uh, industrial heat applications. What, in your opinion, are the remaining challenges and what are the important next steps that need to be taken for the deployment of this technology? Uh, well, Lina, uh, Hiroyuki Goto had already uh, had, um, listed a number of challenges in his presentation, and I think they were pretty complete. But uh, just as a reminder here, the, uh, there's really consensus between all stakeholders, I think, across the world, uh, that the next step before, for, before deployment must be demonstration. This is for de-risking uh, projects, and uh, there are, I think, uh, several um, uh, state uh, organizations need to take a specific responsibility. Uh, so um, uh, the the aim of the demonstration should cover the reactor itself, of course, but also one or several process uh, heat applications and importantly the coupling between both of them and uh, all the issues, the potential issues that may arise uh, regarding the licensability of that combination. So uh, we need the, these results, also technical performance and some economic key data uh, to confirm them and to, to, to really present a business plan for potential investors in deployment. So um, 
Then uh, I think uh, what was not mentioned by Hiroyuki Goto was uh, that uh, we now need to change also uh, a little bit our staff and adapt it because uh, we are now uh, very much dominated by technologists, but on the move from this technology development towards demonstration and deployment, we need new and different people. So for example, we need to uh, write business plans. We need to select business models. Uh, we uh, need to convince investors, customer, politicians. So we have to, to prof professionalize our communication. Uh, we have to mobilize the supply chain. Um, and uh, we heard already some of the elements like fuel qualification may need a long lead time. Uh, then legal questions that need to be solved, uh, for instance, uh, in management of intellectual property. Uh, then uh, we need to also trigger and uh, moderate a political debate uh, for societal agreement. In many countries, this is an obligation. Uh, also, the regulators have to be involved early on and may need to build competence and capacity first. So this is, uh, they don't have necessarily the competence ready uh, for uh, licensing HDGRs or any other new uh, reactors. And not least, I think the societal uh, uh, dialogue uh, has to be really uh, been alive and 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 nurtured uh, from discussions of over several years. I, I believe to ensure also public acceptance. So for for these uh, these approaches here, the Canadian SMR roadmap I think is a, a nice example, um, and uh, I think this is also the reason why many eyes are riveted on what's happening uh, there right now. So uh, for all these opportunities, is it, it is obviously also key to engage uh, a younger generation um, and uh, build uh, new competence and effective workforces to bring such projects to a success, as I said, not only in the area of technology, but also in a much, much wider uh, scope. So we have, uh, as a positive example, a related PhD program in Poland. But uh, again, uh, I think we also need uh, more business-oriented uh, capacity and knowledge. Thank you very much, Maike. Uh, I think you stressed uh, some very important points. The deployment of this technology will rely or will depend on the collaboration and on the communication between different fields that uh, maybe up to now were uh, communicating, but uh, need to be uh, communicating on a more regular basis and in a, in a, maybe in a, in, in a way like uh, uh, Canada is doing right now for uh, the SMRs. Um, and also that uh, youth involvement, of course, will be key for the, for the deployment of, of such technology. So um, maybe uh, with regard to some of the stakeholders of this uh, deployment, I'd like to turn to Aurora uh, from a potential end users point of view do you have any comments on the points that uh, michael just raised and uh, maybe um also if if you could detail a little bit what the challenges are specific to htgrs compared to other low carbon technology options yeah i think michael had a really uh, good point there on the development of the business plans that's uh, something very um really important in terms of how we're looking at it. And, and, and in terms of the challenges that, uh, you know, relative to the other low carbon options that we have, there's, you know, I'd say at this point, I can, there's a number of them. And the key ones that I see that nuclear and, and small modular reactors really needs to, um, we really need to address specifically on is the public and stakeholder acceptance, the historical timeline for the development of nuclear projects and the cost. And so in regards to that further engagement piece with stakeholders, um, we, you know, we need more support for the, for, um, for acceptance. But in addition with the challenges and benefits, um, the introduction of high temperature gas reactors and other advanced reactors adds another dynamic to that, to that conversation. And so the province of Alberta doesn't even have any nuclear facilities at this time. So bringing in nuclear into a new jurisdiction is always challenging, specifically for high temperature gas reactors. Um, that just adds more, more to the conversation. So we require engagement and support from our community and stakeholders um, before we really can make it a key option. In terms of um, the majority of industrial heat applications in Canada, specifically for us in the oil sands, uh, these are businesses and corporations as opposed to government owned public utilities. And, and so that would be, and this, this really speaks to Michael's point on the business case. You know, we have to build out a commercial model that works um, 
in terms of integrating with our existing non-nuclear assets. We have to consider that cost of capital, the timeline for project deployment, uh, and other risks that go along with, with that and, and get a sense of investor appetite for that project. Execution risks associated with nuclear project adds the uncertainty along with looking at generation four um, and high temperature gas reactors. So that timeline to deployment, the regulatory timelines and uncertainty, these are all things that Michael have mentioned. These are things we're watching closely as other SMR projects um, and specifically for high temperature gas reactor projects that are happening elsewhere in the world. And, um, and so the, the timeline, like I was saying, the, that's, that's key to um, that's key to what you know some of these these risks that we are looking at. So an example of of a reactor uh, deployment that we're looking at OPG here in Ontario, um, they have an SR. They're looking at having an SMR operational by 2028. So this definitely provides an interesting opportunity. So of course we're we're monitoring that pretty closely. And so regarding the cost, we're really interested in the opportunity to better understand the feasibility of SMRs and particular high temperature gas reactors with the promise of that overall capital investment, um, you know, and, and that, sorry, the, the promise that it will have better overall capital um, costs relative to the large reactors. And so, but, you know, that's yet to be proven. Uh, we still need to, to see how some of these deployments are going to shape up. And as far as what, what's been historically known is that nuclear is expensive. And as well, we're compounding that with the fact that doing anything in the Alberta oil sands is expensive. So, but we know of, that it is critical for us to make sure that we keep um, our bitumen cost competitive as well as carbon competitive. So that makes this um, a really interesting opportunity. And we know that those risks um, have to be have to be analyzed and, and considered. And, and also, I'll, I'll just make one final point in terms of the cost and the competitiveness. Um, our government has just recently progressed a tax credit for carbon capture. And so that, you know, that kind of gives us um, you know, gives carbon capture a bit of a lead. And in terms of that, the, the commercial availability. So that's, that just makes us um, really have to, to, to kind of, uh, I'll say like pull up our socks and, and really um, determine how we can make the, the SMR concept more cost competitive. Thank you, Aurora. To, to follow up on what you just mentioned, uh, I, I, I would be interested to uh, hear from uh, Satasan how he thinks that uh, the expertise of infrastructure uh, and infrastructure, sorry, of research institutes such as the uh, GAEA can actually be used to help governments and industries like, like yours, uh, Aurora, to tackle the challenges that uh, you, you were detailing. Yes, uh, we think that the roles of research institute are to developing the key technologies needed by commercialization and providing the R&D testbed for unique capabilities, knowledge and databases to industries like vendors and promoting international standardization of technologies and standards through uh, international collaboration. So in our cases, we have experimental capabilities such as HTTR, hydrogen production test facilities, and we have HDTR hydrogen production test facility. So we also have extens extensive computation capabilities, IPs, knowledge, and databases for HDTR design, including core design, safety design, and so on. So uh, if we have a request from the vendors, we may be uh, able to perform experiments using our facilities, provided uh, provide validated code systems, knowledge, databases under a certain framework. And thanks. Thank you, Satasan. So definitely, uh, uh, great support can can be provided. Um, I would like to turn to Gotasan now. D do you have any uh, supplemental or additional points from the report in in terms of uh, how we can step forward the deployment of uh, HTGRs for industrial applications? Yes, thank thank you for asking, and thank you for the very broad, deep, and very condensed discussion. So. From this the last discussion, I feel, yes, as I discussed in the session and my presentation, uh, yes, we recognize the importance of the first project 
to demonstrate the technical or technological and also economical feasibility. But uh, through this discussion, I, I again uh, impressed that uh, it is really, how can I say, uh, difficult to be the first person or first penguin or trailblazer. Yes, to be such person or to find such person is quite difficult challenge, I think. So in this regard, I think that preparing safe situation or reducing uncertainty to risk of such a new project or to be the first person to for such project are really, uh, yes, really important to encourage uh, private sector to join such project. And uh, if I had to add something, uh, yes, actually, I think uh, I want ATGA technologies to become featured more in discussion on topic of industrial decarbonization. Not only the nuclear committee discussion, but also the broad industrial decarbonization discussion. I want uh, the, the, the increased presence of digital technology. Yes, and I think it is important to make many industrial sectors recognize the features and potential, potential benefit of HDGR. So I think it will also initiate more specific communication with them, I mean, the non-nuclear industrial people. So, but uh, at the same time, unfortunately, in some countries, sometimes uh, nuclear related topics are sensitive to discuss and some people seem to be hesitant to be involved in such topics sometimes. So therefore, providing safe or easy to entry communication scheme would be helpful to initiate the communication across different sectors. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Goto-san. Actually, I think this was a very good sum up of uh, what we can take from, from, from the discussion today. And it's actually uh, where we come to the end of, uh, of the discussion. Um, so the main takeaways, I think, uh, from uh, our webinar today uh, could be summarized as follows is that uh, as also um, uh, was mentioned during the discussion when it comes to possible decarbonization in the industry sector uh, HTGRs make a compelling case uh, and their integration with uh, industrial processes benefits from a long history of developments as was extensively discussed today. Um, HTGRs SMRs could provide a potential cost competitive and safe solution to replace the high carbon emitting uh, sources which are currently used for industrial heat applications such as gas and, and, and coal. Uh, the further potential development of HTGRs in industrial applications relies on three main criteria which were mentioned also by uh, Aurora, which are market demand, technical feasibility, and cost. Um, and the former actually is not a limiting factor uh, given the large spectrum of applications in the next decade and beyond. There are also, of course, uh, some remaining challenges if we want to bring that technology uh, to a deployment stage, which will need to be tackled. I think here of uh, further confirmation of the technical performance, uh, the licensability, the economic key data, and of course, public acceptance is one of the key points that will need to be addressed uh, for the HTGR uh, um, development for industrial applications. The deployment will also require strong communication and international cooperation, as was uh, uh, highlighted during our webinar today, between uh, not only uh, nuclear experts, but uh, way beyond that, uh, between various fields and stakeholders. So we will have engineering and R&D, but also licensing regulatory bodies, end users, governments, general publics, and also here, youth involvement uh, will be key. So maybe we can summarize all of it uh, in uh, this this way that continued consideration of this technology will hinge upon the ability of the nuclear industry to deliver this uh, zero greenhouse gas technology in the time frame in which it is needed and at a cost that is of course competitive to other options. And with this, I'd like to conclude today's panel discussion. I'd like to thank again all the panelists for the very interesting points that were raised today. Uh, a great thank you to the OECD NEA for organizing today's webinar and for putting together the report, which I encourage you all to share once it's available on the website. And finally, thank you again for the opportunity to moderate this session. And back to you, Diane. 
Wow, what a great uh, what a great discussion! Thank you so much, Lena, for moderating. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael from uh, ECJRC, uh, Hiroyuki Goto from my team at the NEA, Hiroyuki Seto from JAEA, Aurora Young from Synovus in Canada. Um, what a what a really stimulating conversation, and what we had a really good summary at the end by uh, by. Uh, Lena, but uh, but I'd like to uh, to recap a few points that I heard also, and in particular pull on one of the threads that I saw woven throughout today's conversation that um, that we could even bring to the surface and make uh, make even more explicit. Uh, but first, I'll just recap a little bit of what I heard and what and what we're seeing from from the NEA perspective around the world in a number of different countries, significant momentum uh, around nuclear innovation for a variety of new applications, um, including high temperature to replace uh, fossil cogeneration. Um, and this is driven by uh, strategic policy priorities that is sort of creating this demand for, uh, for creative ways and innovative ways to decarbonize, including hard to abate sectors, but also uh, more um, concentrated uh, or more precise industrial demand, private sector demand um, from specific uh, industrial sectors that have made commitments or have aspirations to decarbonize. So this is a hugely important topic and it has enormous potential, but clearly some challenges still remain. Some of those challenges were discussed today. Some are technical, but even beyond the technical feasibility, which you know those challenges are are being addressed by organizations like JAEA, who we heard from today, and others around the world, uh, there are some non-technical challenges, and. You know, we like to think of those in a framework. That'll be the, the 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 framework that we release this year from NEA in our SMR strategy, where we look at a range of non-technical enabling. Uh, conditions for successful deployment of nuclear innovations, including policy frameworks and regulatory uh, readiness, uh, supply chain capacity, pipeline, uh, fuel cycle readiness, both at the front end and to the back end, of course, public trust building and public engagement, um, cost competitiveness and financing mechanisms. Uh, these are not necessarily unique as concepts to uh, the deployment of high temperature nuclear reactors, but there are in fact some um, aspects of these enabling conditions um, some specific pieces of the puzzle that are quite unique to HTR or high temperature reactors and industrial sector coupling that, that do that started to be um, surfaced today and that require very careful uh, uh, consideration and uh, dedicated work to, to resolve, um, meeting the very specific technical requirements of different industrial um, customers. So we heard from the oil sands today, but also the chemical sector will have slightly different but equally um, uh, important technical requirements, uh, potash, ammonia, hydrogen production, um, uh, let me think of some others here, uh, glass and cement and ceramics. So it'll be really important that the technologies that are under development meet the very specific technical requirements of these unique applications on the demand side. There will be a number of, of challenges that we heard about, we started to hear about today regarding the synchronicity of the planning horizons. If you're planning a micro reactor for a mine site, um, the timing of, uh, of uh, of the, pl the planning cycle for the, the mine site energy project needs to align with the SM or the SMR project needs to align with the mine site project timeline, for example. Regulatory pathways, and here we're talking about sector coupling across multiple industrial, um, industrial sectors. And so you'll have a nuclear safety regulator operating in a space adjacent or overlapping with a different industrial safety regulator, or different, different industrial regulators. And um, those conversations need to start in terms of bringing those, uh, those partners together, prospective partners together. Um, we heard discussions today about the evolution or the innovation around new business models and new operating models, some very unique questions uh, that are related to co-location and industrial sector coupling. Um, so really very uh, great. It was great to hear about the, the progress and the, 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 the how quickly the conversation is advancing. If we think about the stat, the maturity of the conversation on these topics today compared to with just two years ago, the conversation is clearly gaining momentum. 
Uh, so there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. Um, and the thread that I wanted to pull on that was sort of woven throughout today's conversation, but that we could bring to, uh, to, to the surface and really, uh, and really uh, uh, take note is that these cross-sectoral industrial collaborations, the application of nuclear technologies to other industrial sectors, creates this opportunity for the sharing of lessons learned across these sectors. Um, some of these challenges that we've mentioned today um, in, create an opportunity for the transfer of knowledge and the transfer of expertise uh, across industrial sectors. Lessons learned from uh, oil sands sector, for example, uh, could be applied in the nuclear sector and vice versa. Uh, and that might apply in technical areas like materials science, questions that have been solved challenges that have been solved in one sector uh, might be interesting to learn in another sector and apply in another sector, but also around public engagement. Many of the industrial applications that are under consideration for SMR and high temperature um, deployment, uh, they have their own experience and their own expertise and their own history with public engagement and challenges around community engagement and community benefits sharing in that public facing conversation that's not unique. And I think that they, working together, the nuclear sector and these other heavy industrial sectors can probably um, take lessons learned from both sides, um, from both industrial uh, landscapes and really, uh, really tackle these challenges together. Uh, so I wanted to bring that to the surface because I think it's a it's an area where uh, it creates the basis for great optimism. So uh, just to close us off, then uh, a huge thank you to our panelists, uh, to our moderator, and to Hiroyuki Goto from my team for really championing this project and authoring a report that brings together these different voices. Uh, the conversation all started in 2021 at our workshop, but there's been a lot of work done since then, and we're very happy to share it with you in the report that will be available. Nope, that is now available for download on oecd-nea.org. Uh, and so thank you. That brings our event for today to a close. Thank you very much to all our panelists and thank you very much to all who listened in. We appreciate your participation. Today's event has been recorded and will be made available on the NEA website soon. You can also follow the NEA on Twitter and LinkedIn to keep in touch with us and receive updates on our programs and events such as this one. Thank you and good afternoon.